Robert here at the 2010 AES show in San Francisco with Wes Dooley, who is the foremost ribbon designer, ribbon mic designer uh, on the planet, uh, many planets. He just handed me this strange object. I'm not exactly sure how it relates to the new ribbon mic, but I guess you're gonna explain it to us, right? Right. Basically what we have here is a KU3A, which was RCA's best directional, what they called unidirectional mic, what we would call super cardioid, like the Sheps, really good forward, minimum back. And it was designed for the film industry. It was their most expensive ribbon microphone. And it had much of the character of a 44, but it allowed you to get rid of the back stuff. And there are times, as much as I love a Nady figure eight, when you want something that's unidirectional. This is the inside of the microphone at this point. It's the labyrinth. And the labyrinth is the key to, of course, making something that's natively a figure eight unidirectional because you need to be able to damp the rear side out without it being huge, like something like the original 77A, which was the size of a five pound can of coffee. So this was, 1946, 1947, a new product after the war. Studios bought them. The people at Disney bought 30, some bought more. There was one man who made them all, and uh, he made less than 600. And then by the 60s, we were talking about now all magnetic recording, where you want a little more top end, so Condensers were king, and they gradually made their way, the ones that weren't thrown into dustbins, into the music engineer's tool chest. And so there are people who come up to me, especially at the show with this, and say, oh, I have two of those. You know, that's the shoe mic. Or someone else will say, oh, it's the 10,001, because that was the actual manufacturing model number. It, it's sometimes known as a pole cat because the finish was this finish with a stripe on the back, whereas the KU-2 was known as the skunk because it was all black with a white stripe. And the white stripes were so that the guy controlling the boom up there and aiming it at the actors could see where the back was so he could figure out where the axis was. But what was really cool about these mics is it had a really wide angle so you didn't Unlike the shotguns and such, you didn't have to follow it really tightly. You could just put the mic generally there and it would pick up very evenly. And of course, in the studio, what people like is you can have a group of three or four people around the front and they all come through very nicely, all with very similar sound, and they can hear each other and balance themselves, which, as we've noticed, is totally different than doing it in non-real time listening to camps. It's, it's just a performance difference that people listen to some of the old stuff and say, oh wow, how did they do that? And sometimes they say it's the microphone, and part of it is the microphone. Bing Crosby had his own 44. But it was also the fact that they would listen to each other. I'm a big fan of ribbons. I'm also a big fan, why well, I go to Nashville a fair amount, of people who play music together in real time. So here's our microphone, so that when figure eight, when you don't want to listen to both sides, that you have a choice. How would you describe the voice of this, the sound of this, compared to the figure eight version? Well, a figure eight, of course, the figure eight component of any microphone, because a cardio eight is half an omni, half a figure eight, the figure eight's where the proximity effect comes from. And the omnis have no proximity effect. You can tell that if you experiment around some, because you can find, take an SM58, talk to it directly from the side, go in and out and say, oh, no extra bass. Front and back, extra bass. So you know the figure eight is that way, and the omni is that way, and when you're dead to the figure eight, you're just in the omni mode. Since this has some omni component, it has less proximity effect. So it's less proximity effect, but that very smooth ribbon sound with output out to 40k 
but it rolls smoothly off so that you're going this way and it doesn't have the sort of high Q resonances that a stretched diaphragm like a drum head has. So it's a totally different sound and sometimes that's a very useful sound. How did you figure out how to, how to design the labyrinth? I mean, is that based on the original or did you come up with that through experimentation? How do you, how do you figure something like that out? We've been servicing RCA mics for 30 some years since they stopped making them in 76. So whenever we need parts, we have to make them. And so we gradually, 12 years ago, we were here with the 44 because we went to 100% spare parts. That meant our service guy, uh, he could make a mic if he wanted. And the scoring mixers were our early adopters. They all went, wow, a good sounding 44, new. I don't have to worry about it, I can just order it. And they ordered two, three, four of them at a time. So that same crew that we worked for on those, they have KU3s, but RCA never made two directional microphones that weren't figure eights that sounded identical. The KU3As were more consistent. Um, Charlie Gant you know, made them all. First at technical products, then directly for RCA. And he was very consistent. But we've learned things where our material science is a little bit better. We have better test gear. And we also don't accept the variability. John Sank, who was responsible for the 77 from 60 to 76, told me for years he tried to get a budget to go back and work with the 77 over to make them more consistent. And they went, no, nah, they're good enough. And then they went, no, nah, it doesn't make enough money. But they got out of the television studio business because they felt it didn't make enough money. That goes towards zero. And we're 10 people three blocks from my house. I walk to work. So our idea of making a living is different than someone with a big stock. Right, the, the corporate. To take care of. Exactly. Now, so what are you going to price this? I mean, this isn't shipping until January, I'm told. So what will the price be? This will be, um, street will be about $42.50. It'll list, I think, for $47. And the parts do interchange because we started with needing spare parts to work on the mics, just like the 44s. And eventually we said, you know, this was the best unidirectional ribbon mic ever made. And it, ha it has a, a, a very devoted following, but there was only a few made. So let's go 100% on the spare parts like we did on the 44 and make it available to our friends and see if this is useful, because that's basic what a you know basically AEA is about being useful. I'm an engineer. The people I've worked with all uh, like to record music and hear music live. So that's that's our aesthetic. And I'm in love with Streamline Modern. I love the stuff that these giants did in the 30s and the 40s. So we just try to honor what they brought to us. And these are hand built in Pasadena, California, right? Right. I mean, we're three blocks, little building, three blocks from my house. Everybody who makes our parts tends to be within about a 25 minute drive because we're big into knowing who is making what and communicating with them. If we have to, we bring transform, you know, we use transformers that are made locally, second generation. Reichenbach makes the passive transformers we use. Um, there's a bunch of us who just, you know, we're partly in the hot rod aesthetic. Uh, people who really like to make things that work well. And um, one of our chief engineers who died a few years ago had been chief at Caribou. He summed it up when we were making the 44 and thinking about other mics. He said, I don't want to make bad stuff. I want to make really good stuff. I didn't survive being a radio guy in the Marines you know, to do something that doesn't matter. That was, uh... That's awesome. Thank you very much, Wes. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome.